Welcome to No Longer Conformed. I'm Eric Garthy, and we are studying Orthodox Christology, Bible teaching regarding Jesus Christ. In this session, we'll be looking at Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 to 23. Jesus, the God of creation. In John 14, 6, Jesus declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The reality is that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The solution to the problem is Christians have committed themselves to the one who is the perfect measure, Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, the life. We have the absolute standard in the Lord Jesus Christ. Orthodox Christology teaches from the Bible that Jesus is full deity incarnated with perfect humanity. Jesus is God humiliated in sacrificial obedience. Jesus Christ is the creator redeeming his creation. Jesus Christ is the revelation of God's best as Savior. Throughout history, Satan has attempted to reduce Christ by the old lie of Genesis 3.5. Your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. Searching for the light of ultimate truth. What's wrong with the ultimate truth of the Lord Jesus Christ? It's non-negotiable. There's only one way to, uh, to eternal life. Faith in the redemptive work of Christ leads to heaven. All other religious systems of salvation lead straight to hell. Man's pride drives him to find salvation his own way without submitting to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the search for light, is this search for light? Well, let, hold on. Is this search for light a new phenomenon? Paul dealt with it in the form of Gnosticism. The belief system of Gnosticism entered the early church and began to telegraph through the fellowship, promoting confusion and heresy. So the question that we need to consider is, what is Gnosticism? And why is it important to know? Because Paul's letter to Colossians was written to a congregation that was being permeated by Gnosticism and its heresy. Let me give you a bird's eye view of Gnosticism. A group who thought themselves possessors of a unique insight. They were of spirit. All others were just soul and body. Therefore, they were channels of light. Gnosis means knowledge. Their teaching theme was spirit versus matter, kind of a dualism. Spirit is eternal, matter is temporary. Spirit is good, matter is evil. Spirit is real, matter is illusion. In short, it, it kind of goes like this. The world was created by a supreme power. Evil earthly matter would contaminate that power. So a structure of aeons or emanations of light was established between. So the aeons form a bridge between spirit and matter. Those receiving the aeons are the gnosis or the knowledge bear bearers. They produce either sensuality or asceticism in the contaminated. What's the goal? Well, ultimately to escape the evil world of matter into the perfect world of spirit. How did Gnosticism telegraph in the early church? Well, the belief system was applied to Jesus Christ by two paths, the Docetics and the Serinthians. The Docetics taught that Jesus had no real body, but was only a phantom. In fact, Jesus himself was one of the aeons of light. 
The Cerinthians believed Jesus was just a human man. Christ was an aeon that came at baptism and left at the cross. That belief system was applied to the church. Two paths of morality which are important to understanding Paul's letter to the Colossians. The ascetics promoted rigorous rules of holiness. The sensual, licentious, oh, they just let down all barriers to self-indulgence. Rationalization of that, well, the body is only an illusion, so simply deny sin, deny disease and death with positive confession. Don't pay any attention to messages of the senses. Keep moving toward your true spiritual reality. The pursuit of spiritual enlightenment resulted in worship of angels and of false asceticism. Colossians chapter 2, verse 18. Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. The apostle Paul boldly confronted this heresy. How did he do it? Well, proclaiming that all truth is found only in Jesus Christ. Any concepts contrary to scripture are lies of Satan. That includes all religions besides biblical Christianity. No false encouragement that all religions are paths to heaven. Our text for this session is Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 to 23. And this text makes five declarations for our attention and our action. Jesus Christ is Lord, and we must confront today's agenda of self-serving attitudes and relative truth. First, Jesus Christ is Lord of the cross. Look at verses 13 and 14. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. The Savior, we were delivered from the dominion of darkness. We were carried into the kingdom of light. We were purchased by his blood. We were forgiven of our sins. God rescued us from the realm of darkness where we were slaves. And then the apostle tells of the person and work of Christ. From the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Christ's kingdom, where he's king with moral and spiritual sovereignty. This refutes the system of Gnosticism in many lights. Verses 8 through 10. Who also declared to us your love in the spirit. For this reason we also, since today we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every work and decree in increasing in the knowledge of God. Don't allow the truth of Jesus to be depreciated. Jesus Christ is Lord of the cross. Second, Jesus Christ is Lord of communication. Look at verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. The revelator. He's the image of the invisible. Jesus Christ is the very stamp of God the Father. This refutes the Gnostic view of matter contaminating God. Jesus is the clearest picture of the Father without face to face. Don't allow the incarnation to be depreciated. Jesus Christ is Lord of communication. Third, Jesus Christ is the Lord of creation. 
verses 15 to 17. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. The creator. This is crucial. We must understand the word firstborn. Protakas. Firstborn refers to priority of provi of excuse me. Firstborn refers to priority of position, not origin. Christ, as the eternal son, held the position of priority in relation to creation. Why? Well, he was before all things. He created all things, and he holds all things together. Not the Arian heresy of Christ being created to then carry out the creation task. No. This passage affirms the deity of Christ that he is the very image of the Father, the firstborn of the universe. This refutes the Gnostic view of Christ as an aeon. The proper view of the universe is Christocentric. All things were created through him and for him. Do not allow the eternal focus to be depreciated. Jesus, Jesus, Christ is Lord of creation. Fourth, Jesus Christ is Lord of the church. Part one. Look at verses 18 to 20. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. He's the leader. He is first in physical things. He is first in spiritual things. Christ is the head of the church, his body. Jesus is the beginning. Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. Why? so that in all things he may have preeminence, priority in both time and power. The apostle makes a strong attack on, on Gnosticism here in verse 19, the fullness. And in verse, nine, and in verse, uh, verse 2, 9, what's the significance? Well, the Gnostics use the word uh, pleroma or pleroma to refer to the entire host of aeons, sources of light. They were viewed as mediators between God and man. But 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, the apostle clearly says, for there is one, one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. In him all the fullness should dwell. By using their own term, plerama, Paul gathered all divine power in the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 20 attacks docetic Gnostics. They deny the humanity of Jesus Christ. The Father reconciled all things to himself. How? Through the blood of Christ's cross. That refuted the Gnostic view of Christ as just one of the many lights. Jesus Christ is Lord of the church. Fifth, Jesus Christ is Lord of the church, part two, verses 21 to 23. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he is reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, 
which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. He's the master. We were aliens. We were enemies in our mind by our wicked works. He reconciled us through his death. Why? The, for, for God's eternal plan to present us holy, blameless, above reproach. What's the evidence of his work in us? We're grounded in our hope. We are steadfast in our hope. Jesus Christ is absolute Lord of those he saved. If you claim the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal savior, you are obliged to submit to him as your absolute Lord. Your options are submission or rebellion. That's it. It's only two options, submission or rebellion, nothing in between. So I would call you to submit to his lordship today. And you have a great day.